We do not talk about the virgin birth often. We look at it on Christmas Eve as we read through the, the scripture that we just looked at, and, and then we often just move swiftly past it to get to the real focus of that evening, the birth of, of Jesus. It only really comes up in that evening, and we don't spend much time talking about it, the virgin birth and what that has to do with Mary. We're going to take a look at that today, though. That's going to be our, our focus. It's something that uh, is important to us as a church. Now, the, the scripture behind this event is rather serious, actually. When we look at the, the two scriptures, the first of them is Isaiah 7. Now, when we read Isaiah 7, it starts talking about the kings. It starts talking about all the events going on. And it's easy to lose track of the fact that what's going on there is a sort of a national sense of terror. What has happened is... The, the, this nation of Israel has split into north and south, and the southern nation, Judah, is scared because they are facing the potential for invasion. And so the king of Judah, King Ahaz, is just not sure what he's going to do because he's facing this invasion from the north. And the prophet Isaiah shows up and tells him, King, chill. It'll all be okay. That's not exactly what he says. That's kind of my paraphrase of it. But that, that's what he's getting at. Just relax. Stand firm in your faith or you will not stand at all. But you can't stand on this. Just relax. And then the prophet makes this an amazing offer. He says to the king, King Ahaz, you may pick a sign. Whatever sign you'd like. Ask God from the deepest seas to the highest heavens. What, what sign would you like to show that God is with you? in this moment. And the king demurs and says, no, I can't do that. I couldn't do that. And the prophet sees through that and says, you know, you're, you're trying God on this one. You're not standing on, on your faith. You don't really believe, do you? This king is the sign you'll get, says the prophet. This is the sign that you will receive. A young woman, a virgin, will give birth. And by the time this child can tell right from wrong, by the time this child is 12, those two nations you're worried about invading will be gone. Their nations will be laid waste. Those kings will be no more. And you will truly know that God has been with you. In fact, that will be the name of the child, God with us. This is the sign. And that is indeed what happens. Those nations go poof. The, the ki threatening kings go poof. And a child is born. And uh, we don't know exactly who the child was. We don't know much about the mother, if anything. But we do know that that's how that situation unfolded. Now with Luke, the, the other passage we have that gets into this, this child being born of a virgin, there is... Again, this is hundreds of years later, again there is this problem. It's, it's not a potential invasion from the north. What they're scared of in Israel is the Roman occupation that is currently ongoing. And what is uh, happening is we're getting a lot closer in this passage than we were before. In the first passage in Isaiah, we are at the level of kings and prophets and big mass national, international relations. Now we're getting a lot closer, a lot tighter in. What we're seeing here is one angel showing up to one woman and giving her this news and telling her, you will have a child by the power of the Holy Spirit. God will be with you and this child will be called, will be named the Son of God. And you're going to do this with someone else too. This is not something you have to go alone. Your, your cousin Elizabeth you know, the one that everyone thought was barren for so long. She is going to have a child too. She's already six months pregnant with a child. And so after a question or two, Mary tells the angel, let it be with me as you say. Mary says yes. That is what Mary says. Mary says yes. And with that decision, Mary becomes one of the key figures of the Christian church because Mary says yes. So not only does she become the mother of Jesus, as the first person to say yes to Jesus, she becomes the first disciple of Jesus. Someone who says yes to Jesus is a disciple. And so in that sense, Mary is the first disciple, the first follower of Jesus. And so not only is she the mother of Jesus, she can also be seen as the mother of the church. 
She is not only the mother of the church, she is the person who, who helps us in one way see how powerful the church is in bringing us together. For she is the one who stands at the foot of the cross, and when her son is dying, he looks down upon her and upon the disciple whom he loves and says, Woman, behold your son, and son, behold your mother. And right there, they become family. These two people that until that point had nothing in common other than following Jesus, it turns out that, that that's enough to make them mother and son. And so Mary, Mary is the one who said yes to Jesus, becomes the first disciple, the mother of the church. She's the one who shows us how powerful the connection between followers of Jesus is. All because she said yes. And so Mary is very, very cool. A woman to be respected and honored. And she plays this, this central role of honor and respect in the church for centuries. For, for, a long, for just century after century, from the early church onward, she is greatly respected and honored until things get just a bit wonky during the Middle Ages. Something happens there, and I need to tell you a bit of a story so you understand. You see, in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church had an argument amongst itself. We often think of the Catholic Church as this big, vast, monolithic thing that is all of one opinion. And, and no, that's not really what the Catholic Church is. The Catholic Church, the Roman Catholic Church, is an extended family, and on occasion they have their family feuds. We're seeing one right now in some interesting ways in uh, the Pope, new Pope, Pope Francis. Some people love him, some people not so much. And they're having this sort of inter-family uh, argument about the new Pope. In the same way, back in the Middle Ages, 1200s, 1300s or so, there was this uh, inter-family argument about Mary. Some of them holding to a certain view of Mary, uh, and others uh, different views. And it was the different types of monastics that were having this argument. Different type of uh, monastic orders, Benedictines, Dominicans, Franciscans, etc. And so, what's happening is that certain parts of the Catholic Church are beginning to see Jesus as being so scary as being so terrifying, as being the one who is going to judge us that they're beginning to be afraid of him. And, and so what's happening is Mary becomes the one who intercedes for, the, for us when we're so scared of Jesus that we're not even sure we want to talk to him. And, and so we start to see artwork in those Middle Ages that has Mary looking up to heaven and, and Mary under Mary's voluminous skirts. There would be people peeking out from under the skirts and looking up. These would be the good Christian folks who had lived a good life and they were good people, but they were scared of the judgment of Jesus Christ. And so they had gone to Mary so that Mary would protect them. And so Mary ends up being sort of the, the source of mercy, that, that Jesus is, is, has justice and, and Mary is the source of mercy. And then if you go to Mary, Mary will pray for you and, and Jesus couldn't turn down his mama. I mean, that's just not going to happen. Mary. And, and so in this way, uh, Mary begins to take on these roles that are really pushing, what she, push, pushing her into new ways. You, th you hear terms like co-redemptrix and queen of heaven in the, same, in the way that Jesus is the new Adam, the Adam who gets it right. Mary becomes the new Eve who, who gets it right. And so she becomes perfect and ever virgin. And, and this is about the same time that it t popular piety takes a hold of Mary and she just becomes the one that everyone goes to to, pr to pray to and it just, it gets out of, kind of out of hand. And so it takes a while uh, for that to get pulled back. And, and the Catholic Church today would not say some of these things about Mary, but there was a time when parts of the Catholic Church would have. And so what I think that has engendered in, in some of us is a little bit of a, a wariness about getting too excited about Mary. Because it got so out of hand at one point. We're kind of wary about getting excited about Mary today. I, I wonder to this day how often Catholics get asked, why do you pray to Mary? And they have to explain that they don't pray to Mary, they, they pray to ask Mary to pray for them. And, um, and so we get, this, we get nervous about Mary. And 
And I think in some of the ways that Mary was made a big deal of in these Middle Ages, I think it, it becomes a problem in the way that she was exalted because if she is ever virgin and perfect, and if she is the second Eve, and, and if she is the Queen of Heaven, if she is so much better than us, then it becomes hard for us to turn to her and follow her and emulate her. It's hard to learn from her as the first disciple of Jesus if she is somehow so special and different than us. I think that Mary is amazing and awesome and I really deeply respect her, but I don't respect her because she is somehow better than you or than me. I think she is amazing because she said yes. I think that's what makes her so amazing, is that she is a normal person who said yes when God asked something hard of her. She is such a normal person. If someone like Mary walked in church right now and sat down next to us in the pews, we'd wonder why she was so late. But we would not think twice about it. Mary is a normal person who said yes when God asked. I believe, uh, as we read scripture, we see that she is a normally wedded person as well. We read in, uh, it's in Mark 3, we read of Jesus having brothers and sisters who come and beckon him, saying he needs to come with them. And, and so if he has brothers and sisters, that, what does that mean of Mary? That she was a, a, a wedded woman who fully was active in, in that marriage, and that Jesus had brothers and sisters, and he was the eldest of, of them. They, he shared a mother, but not a father, obviously. And so we can ask her to pray for us, just as much as I could ask any of you to pray for me. But that doesn't make her better or worse. What, what makes her so important is that she is the one, she is the first one who said yes to Jesus. She is the first disciple. She is the model, mother of the church. She is an example to emulate. And we emulate her and respect her and follow her precisely because she is just like us. And she said yes. It, because if she can say yes to God, so can we. If Mary can say yes to God, so can we. What does it mean for Mary to say yes? Well, when you say yes to something like this, you don't know what's going to happen next. Right? When, when Mary says she's going to have this child, you know, you say yes to having a child, you don't know what's going to happen. Just this last week, my, my two-year-old, Sophia, I heard her crying, uh, Mom, 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 Dad, Dad, Dad. And I heard her crying, and so I walked around the corner, and there she was in the, she was in the bathroom, in the bathroom sink, and just crying because she was stuck in the bathroom sink. And I looked at her and said, Sophia, how did you get up there? And she looked at me and said, I don't know. And I, and I got her down and, and, and we all just kind of laughed at that because you never know what's going to happen when you say yes to having a kid. You never know where they're going to show up. <laughs> and then multiply that by not just being any child but the Son of God too. That would be even more surprising. And so when we say yes to God, whether it's yes to having a child or when we say yes to be baptized, we say yes to being married, we say yes to... to, bat, uh, to uh, serve at the church, we say yes to give of what we make, we say yes to forgive and to reconcile and be a prince of peace, we say yes to be a foster parent, we say yes to go on a mission trip. Whenever we say yes to God, we know we're going to do something important, but we're not quite sure where it's going to go. And that's why we respect Mary, because she said yes, even though she knew. Well, she didn't know. She didn't know where it was going to take her. What makes her yes possible, what made it possible for Mary to say yes, as I understand it, is two things. Two things that made it possible for her to say yes and, and then consequently for us to say yes as well. First, she could say yes because she knew who asked her. She trusted the one who asked her. If you think about the craziest thing that you have said yes to, Think about that for a minute. What is the craziest thing that you have said yes to? Did you do it because it seemed like a good idea? Or did you do it because you trusted the person who asked? Mary could say yes because she trusted the person who asked. She trusted and knew the person who asked, and so can we. We can know and trust 
when God asks us, because we can know God through our worship, through our prayers, through our, the practicing of the presence of God and music and communion and community and time together and time by ourselves, we can find God and know God, know who it is that asks of us. The second thing that, that makes it possible for Mary to say yes, the first thing is knowing the person who asked. The second thing that makes it possible is that she's not going to do it alone. She is told, right after she's told what she's being asked to do, have this child, she, the angel tells her, and your cousin Elizabeth over here is going to have a child as well. You're not going to have to walk this alone. She's already down the path. You just have to follow her. You can do this together. And so we see that saying yes to God is never something we do alone. Following God, following Jesus is a team sport. It is something that we do together. When I say yes to God, you've got my back. When you say yes to God, I've got yours. When, when you, each other say yes, you, you work with each other and support each other so that we never do the, these, these things alone. And so we see, and we, we see today that Mary said yes. Mary said yes. This normal person said yes. And she said yes because she knew the one who was asking of her. And she had others to walk with. And because she had this, she could say yes to what God asked. And if she can say yes, so can we. And so when you next have a sense of something, when you have a sense that there is something stirring in you, when your prayers become troubled, when your reading of Scripture leaves you thinking new thoughts, when the silence seems very full, when you think God is calling you to something, Say yes. Amen.